Hello and welcome everybody uh, to our Justice Fridays. Um, and this month our theme for, well, yeah, our theme for it right now is invisible illness. And we have just like saying who's in the room right now. So we have Jojo and Jenny, Matthew, Pastor David Batista, and our special guest, we have Amy here. Um, and she's going to be talking with us about her experiences. Um, I can't remember if I'm going to give away any spoilers. So that's all I want to say. So please just <laughs> join in, listen to the conversation, interact in the chat if you want to. And, and yeah, thank you for joining us. So I'll hand it over to whoever's next. It's a prayer. Oh, that's me as well, that's isn't it? Well. I'm sorry. <laughs> We planned this like weeks ago, so, okay, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, this week and the opportunity that we are allowed to come together and discuss um, something that's really important um, and affects millions and maybe even billions of people every day. So just um, help us to listen, to understand and to not, um, talk over someone or just listen to gain a better better understanding of other people's experiences um, to help us to grow and be more compassionate and empathetic like you are. So thank you. And we pray that this discussion is a wonderful one. Amen. Amen. All right, over so, to you, Amy. Okay. Uh, stop being sick or you're fired. That's my beginning. Imagine it. You're in your boss's office. You have a chronic condition. How do you feel? Scared. Anyone? <laughs> I'd say scared. Scared. All right. Anyone else? Oh, no? man. I, I would say awkward, probably would probably be the first thing that would, yeah, awkwardness. Um, I would say very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Me, I'd say like, helpless, like, I've been like, what do I do in this situation? Like, I don't really, like, <laughs> really, yeah, like, what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. Is that everyone? <laughs> Everything? All right. Well, what would you do is the next question. Uh, I don't even know what I would do, to be honest. I don't, I don't think I'd even know. Me neither. <laughs> okay. Am I taking into consideration that the employer has said that to me before yeah. I've said something? I feel really threatened and yeah, I'll just like not know what to do. Yeah. I wouldn't feel safe at all, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah maybe angry. <laughs> Good one. Yeah. 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 Frustrated. Frustrated. I've got a, a couple that I felt at the time was broken and yeah. resigned. So um, if I just carry on with what else <laughs> I have to say, um, it will sort of explain why I felt resigned. Um, so you're 23, idealistic and naive with a mortgage and bills to pay. You used to love this job, but the last few months have been hell. A new line manager, his lack of understanding and his unreasonable demands. Whatever he was expecting, it wasn't you. You feel worn down. You never expected that the courtesy of a heads up would turn to this. It started innocently enough. He asked if there was anything you needed, but that slowly changed over months. In every one-to-one -one meeting, he brings up your epilepsy. How does it affect your life? How does it manifest? Is it controlled? What are your triggers? However, you're optimistic. Maybe he's just curious and interested. Maybe not. More meetings and steadily more intrusive questions delivered with an air of judgment. If it is triggered by stress and tiredness, 
How can you work? Don't we all get stressed and tired at work? Can you still work after a seizure? This happened for months and it's getting to you. I spoke to your hiring manager and I asked why she hired you. She said you were smart. I want you to prove it. Um, what, you've been proving it for months? He asks, why didn't you go to uni? Was it because of your epilepsy? You feel uneasy. Does he think you're stupid? Surely your work proves you're not. The meetings are now full of pressure. Why don't you go to uni now or do a diploma? You say you wouldn't mind, but you're, you, you don't think it's necessary. After all, you're an admin. A degree is hardly necessary. With months of this going on, your nightly seizures increase steadily. You're more and more tired, but you go to work anyway. After more weeks of this, your seizures start spilling into the day. First, you try and hide it, but the tiredness is clear on your face. Your boss notice, notices and sends you home. You start missing the odd morning at work, um, recovering. It is unavoidable with overbearing tiredness caused by stress, sleepless nights, and increased seizure activity. The, the boss isn't happy. When you're off sick, everything still runs smoothly. Are you even doing anything? If you could get brain surgery to fix you, would you do it? And then time was up. Having been off sick with the flu, your mind foggy from a lack of sleep and the overexertion of your brain, an ultimatum. If you can work without being off sick, you may continue to work here. We've reduced your yearly contract to two months. If you call in sick, you're fired. Having heard this, would you feel something different and or would you act differently? I mean, it's impossible to act differently. It's not something you can change. I think I would be looking legally. I think that would be the only way forward to actually like, so this is what my boss said, what can, like, that's the only way you'd be able to stay in that job is to get something legal on your side. Mm -hmm. And then would you want, did you want to stay in that environment after all that? I mean, yeah. how, how, do, how do you, how do you cope with that? I think, wow. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you want answers to that? Because <laughs> I can say legally it was up against an international company. So I don't think it would have even gone to court. I think it probably would have just, if anything were to happen, they may have just paid me off. Um, secondly, yeah, definitely didn't want to stay there. <laughs> Anyone else? it's um it's kind of like being uh what's the saying like stuck between a rock and a hard place because like on the one hand you know you've got your condition that's you know causing all this trouble mm -hmm. for your work job but then at the same time your work job is also influencing you and then having a no negative effect on your condition as well so it's kind of like yeah it's an impossible impossible situation to an extent because yeah, would like either way you go, you're still going to have some kind of negative impact from like whichever route you, you choose. So it's mm -hmm. yeah, a, a difficult one. And to think that there are, you know, thousands, millions of people that have to deal with these kind of things, yeah. um, a lot of the time by themselves, it's kind of yeah, blows my mind sometimes. Yeah, um, I think that um, there was one option that I could have taken, but chose not to, and that was to go over his head to his boss or talk to HR. Um, but by that point, I had already given up. I was like, I'm out of here. Um, so that may have worked. I don't know, because I didn't do it. <laughs> so there's that. Um, but another thing to say is, this was purely my line manager pretty much everyone else was sort of fine. And he hid it in our one-to-one -one meetings. So it was me against just one person who was my boss. So I think that's quite important to say. Most people were supportive. 
Um, sorry, Amy, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but just like, just as I was thinking about it, it was just like angering to know that you had to even go through that. <laughs> and this guy sound, whoever this person was, they sound like a coward because <sighs> they did that deliberately one-to-one -one because they knew if other people were aware of it, they would not be able to display that same behavior. And I'm, I'm probably jumping the gun on like a lot of questions you're going to ask us, so I apologize. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's just one of those things that makes me think, and this is why it's so important for us to, to yeah, like, like what we're doing now, like hear your voice, at, like hear your experiences, because people would just think like, oh, like, why can't you just do this? Or why can't you do that? But like the, the amount of personal attacks that you mm. received is just totally despicable and never. And it built over time. That one of the things is that it built over time. So um, if it had been straight away, you're fired if you, if you don't get better, right? Then obviously I'd be like, well, this guy's ridiculous, right? Um, but it was a bunch of microaggressions to begin with. And then it just increased and increased. And by that point you're in, you know, so it's, um, but that's the, that's the other thing that I was going to say is that um, one of the questions is what role does the nature of invisible illness play in this story, right? So because nobody can see it and he's doing it to me one-on-one, -on -one, it's hidden, right? So that's the nature of invisible illness in itself. And the other people, even if they did know, it's hard to say whether they would have done anything because maybe they believe him, you know? So what do you guys think? What role do you think invisible illness takes in this? I think there's also a big element of not understanding it as well. Mm -hmm. So you have... <laughs> to use the term completely wrongly, but normal person <laughs> uh, yeah. who, uh, who, you know, hasn't, hasn't had to, to even think about what it would be like to live life um, with an illness that no one else can see. And, and so they're only experiencing life from their one perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And they haven't had to consider what it would be like to try and, and I, I, mean, I think about this from, you know, some of you know that I dislocated my finger two weeks ago mm. and you don't realize how much you need your finger yeah. until you can't use it. And so, you know, I've been, you know, I live my whole life, 38 years <laughs> and uh, I've taken this one finger for granted. And, uh, and now that my finger currently has a disability, <laughs> mm. uh, I, uh, I realize how much I need it, uh, particularly as we're moving house. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's kind of like I've, I've received a wake up call. I mean, yeah, a, a dislocated finger is nothing compared to like an illness that affects you for a lifetime. But if you use it as an example, you know, I, I realize that some aspects of my life have had to change over the last two weeks just because of one finger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. What do you think the boss should have done instead? I think that's pretty easy to be honest. <laughs> Educate himself <laughs> or be educated. Yeah. I think okay. I, I, it like in an ideal world, it would, it, that's, that's what it would be nice to like have someone who's understanding and someone who's going to take and make the time to actually find out what you know what that person's going through or, or or just a little bit of like what they might be experiencing and I remember when I was in secondary school one of our projects um because we read a, a book I think it was about um uh someone with hi uh, hydrocephalus it's not an invisible illness but stemming from that we had to choose um choose a type of illness and for I think it was like three days or something write a journal about how that how that made us feel 
Um, and it was an exercise to make us more compassionate for people that basically like whose lives we don't lead. So I think for me, like I chose to be like, not chose, but like I covered my eye with like a patch or something for a week just to see like what it was like to have one eye. And it, it was, it really changes your whole perspective about how someone's, how someone's living their life. And, and it really, it just humbles you and puts you in a place where it's like, oh, wow, like every day, this is every day. This is, this is a chronic thing that people have to, have to experience living with. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that like, I'm sure that like, it's, it's not only you who's had to come across that type of ignorance, um, not just in the workplace, but like in school, it, children can be really cruel. <laughs> not even children, adults can be really cruel, teenagers, any, any human being can be really cruel. Um, but it's like due to this lack of awareness of, of, of asking yourself what what might this person be going through and trying to yeah just trying to be compassionate yeah um what do you think drove the discrimination i think um yeah to go off what, of what ej was saying before about how like it takes education and like informing yourself uh i think partly that i think it would be you know in that instance, the boss's role to make sure that he's educated on, you know, whatever his employees might need to be able to work properly. Um, yeah, but then at the same time, I guess, going back to your other question about how, how does the illness being invisible factor in, I guess, yeah, a lot of the times, um, oh, my mind's gone blank now. Uh, yeah, so, a lot of the time it being invisible kind of gives people an excuse to either not do anything about it or just kind of shy away from even being interested in it in the first place. Um, so yeah, so it's part of the education, but then also I think you have to actually, yeah, really try and drive yourself to actually care about the individuals and what they're going through. So then you can actually kind of deal with or help them deal with, um, you know, whatever it is they might need on a more, yeah, personal level, I suppose, because I feel like, yeah, invisible illnesses in general, as far as like social topics go, it's quite an ignored one. People aren't, don't really know know much too much about it. Um, so yeah, so there's that side. So you, you have to kind of try and push through that, I suppose. And yeah, kind of be more personal uh, with, yeah, whoever might need it, I suppose. I suppose also the your boss was probably seeing you as an inconvenience. Yeah. Like he just wanted he just wanted someone that he he, he didn't have to <laughs> make any extra effort for or something like that. He like he just didn't he didn't want any anything beyond what he thought he had to do. Yeah. Um sorry, just I had a question, Amy, like out of sure. interest, where um were there any accommodations or adjustments that were made for you that um, he wasn't adhering to he was supposed to yeah definitely that's um the law for disability um you're supposed to make adjustments he his only adjustment was um you can come in late to work that was it mm. so um i'm an admin i could have worked from home if i had a laptop but no no laptop had to go in and be there um they didn't really make any accommodations so that that kind of makes me wonder actually like when we're talking about invisible illnesses i wonder given you know that kind of attitude that the boss had if it was a more visible illness i'm questioning whether or not the situation would have been any better really because given the kind of attitude that he had towards you even if um, you know the illness was more visible and other people could see it as well, would his attitude actually be better, or would it just be he feels more forced to kind of um, ap appeal to that kind of? Norm? I think if your disability is visible, 
people feel the pressure um, from everyone else looking. So if your uh, illness is invisible, people can ignore it. And quite often they choose to because they don't want to get involved, you know? Um, whereas if it's uh, visible, people, I mean, sometimes it's sort of a pitying attitude, but they're like, oh, we should help this person because like you can see they deserve it, you know? Whereas they might even uh, choose to not believe there's actually anything wrong with the person with invisible illness because they can ignore it, you know? Um, I would say uh, my own answer to the discrimination thing was probably fear for um, just uh, the unknown, but also um, he was a very driven person. So I think that he was worried I would threaten his career. Um, so he wanted me out. And so I feel like he basically predicted in advance that I was not a benefit and I should go. And then he just pushed me away. You know, that's my, it's, in a, it's a guess because I didn't ask. I don't even think it'd have given an honest answer if I did. Um, all right. Is that, is that everyone's question? So should I go on to the next bit? <laughs> yeah next bit let's go <laughs> uh this sort of treatment was not completely new i remember seeing my permanent record in sick form in big red letters across the top of the page it said something like high risk dis disability and suddenly certain events from my school life made sense um when i first went to secondary school i was put into special needs classes um completely unnecessarily and intrusively into my uh daily school life so it was over other lessons um one teacher gave me different work from everyone else i was often brought to the side of classes or kept behind and asked if i was understanding the work and some teachers were often surprised when i did good work i was asked in sick form not to miss my lessons or be kicked off the co or i would be kicked off the course my grades were fine, but I think they were afraid of a drop in their academic numbers. Again, I guess, but that's what came across from the discussion with the teacher. Um, and then so on. Um, other things happened, but time, you know. Um, then there is the behavioral shift. When people know that you have a disability, they sometimes become too nice in a condescending, pitying way. Although some people, quite a lot of people are genuine because you know, they'd have to be, <laughs> can't all be mean. Um, some people assume you're stupid. Uh, people include you because they think they have to and some people exclude you because they assume you're incapable. But these behavioral shifts are a societal problem and not just a school problem. I used to think there was a problem with school as an institution. Now I think it's a problem with all institutions and a problem yet to be solved. Um, what should the school have done instead? It all boils down to education once again, doesn't it, to be honest? I mean, um, I remember Amy actually the first time probably the only time actually I've seen you fit and it was it was I think it was relatively new to you then um, oh. and you weren't quite sure what was going on some of the times and um, we were sat in the car in a caravan and someone just like you started just moving a little bit and someone moved your hot drink away and you immediately grabbed it back when you were done as if nothing had happened and mm. I remember thinking okay I need to learn a little bit about this because that I wasn't quite sure what has gone on um and my mum's in the medical field and stuff so I asked a few questions but I say it ultimately boils down to to education because my my auntie and my cousin now are epileptic and it, it runs in the family they found out so um it's definitely something that we're not aware that's happening to people to our loved ones all around us yeah. And until you actually know someone one-on-one, -on -one, then you're unlikely to look into it 
and actually find out how you can help if you can help and and like what other measures that would actually help not <laughs> not hinder so i think and for you to say a school didn't understand is really really worrying <laughs> like what is our school system about they should be top on they should be on top of everything to be able to help every student that comes away that comes their way like dyslexia putting on extra classes um in reading and writing or wherever they need it it should be something like that like they should be able to see these signs and almost help with the diagnosis and like help you yeah i i'm can't believe the school <laughs> gosh uh, yeah, it does remind me of a good friend of mine. He does um, have a little bit of autism. He was, you know, on the autism spectrum. So he as a way, as a mechanism of self-defense. He describes himself. I, I remember, I still remember the day we met. He does describe himself. Hey, I'm so-and-so. And I, I was... Um, I was told I'm on the spectrum to, to, with autism. It's like, and, and years later, I could ask him, why, why do you introduce yourself uh, that way? And then he simply says, oh, that's, that's really a mechanism of self-defense. So people can understand why I do things the way I do things, why I say things the way I say things, and why I react to, to noises and um, certain situations that I'm not expecting to happen the way I do. And, and that was shocking for me. It's like, it, it gets me like emotional because it's, it's simply like, I need to have a shield when I interact with people, otherwise they can hurt me. Does that even make sense? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, and then he says, he goes on and say, oh, some people deliberately, knowing the circumstances that I face, choose to hurt me with the words and actions and so on. Um, so I do not have one of those, as we um, themed today, invisible uh, illnesses or, or disabilities, but illnesses. But yes, I do relate to the fact that people choose deliberately to hurt others, knowing what the circumstances are. Um, yes, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah, um, I would say that's quite a common self-defense mechanism for people, especially an invisible illness person, because obviously if it's physical, you can see, so they don't have to be like, oh, I've lost an arm you know um but i used to do that as well i used to introduce myself say i'm an epileptic but the reason i would do it is because if if i was going to be friends with you um i'd want you to be friends with me and not run away and if you ran away then yeah no we're not friends so <laughs> yeah defense mechanism makes sense um so just to add to that, like it, defense mechanisms are something that I think people can generally relate to mm -hmm. in, in one way or another. And but oft, I think where where the difference is, is that we obviously we're going to have different defense mechanisms for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's about understanding why why someone even has to do that. So, mm -hmm. you know. Why does someone have to do it because they're a woman? Why does someone have to do that because they're black? Why does someone have to do that because of a disability? You know, every, everyone holds those those kind of uh, defense mechanisms. And I guess part of the role that we would like to see coming from society is, is no longer having that need for people to even have a defense mechanism. Mm. Um. Amy, would, would you mind if we read um, a comment or, or some, can somebody please um, read one of our uh, comments on Facebook? Sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Pastor Cliff, yeah, Pastor Clifford Herman, if, if, you, if you don't mind, Stephen. Yeah, I can read it. Thank you. 
Uh, so Clifford says, I am one of those who are fearful in front of those with invi invisible illnesses because mm -hmm. I want to do the right thing, but fear I will not get it right. Mm -hmm. Is education the key? Question mark. Since everyone's illness is different, maybe I should ask, how would someone like Amy like to be treated, especially around people like me who are fearful about doing the wrong thing? I think the last one is here. I am honest here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very good question. How would I like to be treated? Um, the easy answer would be as if I didn't have one, but obviously there's logistical like issues with that in a workplace. So for so in a workplace, I think treat me the same as anyone else, but um, keep the law in mind. So the law says they have to uh, provide adjustments, which is what we were talking about earlier. So in my case, if they'd provided me with a laptop, then I could have worked from home and it, it would I wouldn't have missed any of the time. So, um, but anybody with a disability definitely wants to be treated the same. In terms of education, yes, I think it's definitely the key. Um, I would argue that any workplace, um, at the very least, the team that a person works with um, should, you can get um, training from places like, for, in my case, Epilepsy Action provide training to businesses, uh, schools, um, just, you know, different institutions and in how to uh, behave around, like not behave around, uh, behave towards people or like how not to behave. And um, so things like that, that people, it's out there for people to use. And I don't think they charge for it. I think you just have to provide a day for them to do it. To do it. It's a charity um, that wants to help people with epilepsy. So the actual training is free. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, you just have to think about things like that. But yeah, no, um, in terms of, in, especially for me intellectually, I'm the same as everybody else. So the only time there should really be anything different really is if I'm having a seizure. And in, in that scenario, you just need to know that um, if I'm safe, I'm fine, just leave me. And if I'm um, in a dangerous position, move me away from it. And that's it. Um, if it's a, an incredibly bad seizure, then I would need to be put in the recovery position and held there and wait till it's finished. So it's, it's not actually too hard to find out why. And that sort of question for like safety and uh, comfort, um, I think people would be fine with you asking that. I think it's, invasive questions that people are not comfortable with hmm. so i hope that answers that <laughs> yeah i think that i think that answers the question really well uh, yeah um, what we yeah. do need to do now though is we do need to move on to our next section <laughs> uh which i believe is matthew bringing us uh, a character from this from the bible yeah um so to start off uh, i'm gonna read from luke 8 verse 43 to 48 um to the story of um the woman who was bleeding um but i'll read the story and then we can talk about it after um so yeah luke 8 verse 43 to 48 is. And a woman who was there had been a subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him, being Jesus, and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately the bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, people, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that the power had gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. She told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. 
So, um, so I read up on um, the background of this, and apparently the um, bleeding was seen back then as being unclean, um, and so because of that, um, people, the people saw like that bleeding. And they just sort of assumed, oh, this person, this woman is unclean. Um, they get away from her, so kick outcast her from society without um, sort of asking her or like seeing what was actually the problem and just um, that, that dealing with it that way. Um, so, like, just going from that, um, like, do we like are there certain certain scenarios where, like, in the modern day, where we would outcast people because of something we can't see, like an, an, an illness we can't see um, because of like, it's, I don't know, like affecting um, something or, or like, or we, we, or we see them as like unclean or like not part of society for some, for some reason. So it's like, is there anything um, that you've seen or um, that there might be um, out there? Um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the first question. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd say anything to do with like mental illness, um, probably not, not so much in the past 18 months because people's mental health has deteriorated so rapidly that it can't be ignored anymore. But um, yeah, anything to do with mental health or neurodiversity. So um, uh, I like, for instance, in my family, um, on my mother's side of the family, like my mother's father's side of the family, um, there's a lot of autism. And unfortunately, what used to happen in the past and, and what still does happen in some countries is that people are outcasted, people were chained to sheds, people were put in separate areas. And um, my, it would have been, I guess, my great, great, grand, great, grandfather and his wife were subjected to like electro shocks and different things like that and just lots of cruel things that because there was no answer to explain it was kind of just wrapped up in your sinful person and we need to shun you and it's just really horrible so yeah and and, and just when it comes to mental health as well like yeah if anyone was depressed um, it's just kind of like, ooh, ooh, like it's almost if, as if you can catch depression um, instead of supporting that person through something. So I guess that's like generational of how thankfully things have gotten better, but it's still that it's still that communication that you need to be having pe with people that are actually experiencing what's going on so that you can try to as much as as much as you know we're we're able to and like asking God to just like help us to if we can't understand fully because we never will because it's that person's individual experience help us to just be able to support them the, uh, to whatever extent that might might be um I have something I'd like to say um there's a certain percentage of the UK population now that still believes that epilepsy is contagious, even though it's a, a neurological disorder. So it's your brain <laughs> um, not working quite the way it should. Um, so that still exists. Um, it's, it's getting less and less, but it still exists. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it really. <laughs> Uh, so, so we do have a, a question on Facebook um, from Jackie, but we will leave it till after the we've looked into the biblical character a bit. So I think it'll, yeah, be it'll be good to look at it afterwards. So we do see your question, Jackie. So we will come to that eventually. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure how many of you did watch uh, this beautiful movie called uh, Letters to God where this little boy faces some kind of bullying and discrimination and um, some kind of enforced segregation because of his condition. And then to the point of somebody asking, is that contagious? 
And that's what we see. That's what we see on the narrative that Matthew is portraying. It's like people are, uh, in those days, they would be asked, and they would ask the very same question. Is that contagious? Is that going to affect me? Instead of me asking, how can I support? And how, how can I be of any help if I can, if possible, at all, to the person being um, sent into this enforced segregation. And that's what comes to my mind. So uh, really quick, Jackie on Facebook, she says, uh, I think as Amy hinted, some people may exclude someone from some event or activity because they assume they are not capable when really it's much better to always ask and invite anyway. If they then turn down the offer because they cannot take part in that activity, then so be it. They have still been included and felt thought of. I think um, hearing the story read for the first time, it really it struck me how it was basically gossip that ended this woman's life. Like she no longer could function in her community because she confided in a friend possibly and they spread it. Like how often does um, one little thing suddenly blow up and become a huge thing when it really should never have been one in the first place and it wrecks someone's life. Um, I think that's that's the main thing that <laughs> hasn't really struck me about this story before, but it's an invisible illness. Like she might have looked a bit pale, a bit lethargic from losing blood, but otherwise, like it's someone that she's confided in that has that has spread this about her, and yeah, I was just. <laughs> I think the other problem that's faced in the story as well is that the the people that are alienating her and are creating that segregation are doing so legally and so they're not acting on something then they're, they're not supposed to be doing if you see what i mean it's legally that's what they're supposed to be doing because the law of moses says that though it, if you were to look at it a bit more closely, you'd see that, you know, the law of Moses is specifically talking about a situation that's supposed to be on a cycle that doesn't happen for 12 years. <laughs> and so it's, you know, it, it is talking about a different scenario, but, you know, for people that are trying their best to follow as closely the law of God so that they can gain God's favor or, or whatever it is, you know, they're, you're going to end up in extremes and and one of the extremes ends up being this this lady being outcast from society because of a condition that she has no control over yeah because even if you look in the details like it said she she spent all her money trying to cure whatever it was that was causing the issue and i mean like there are so many people that have gone into debt to try and cure illnesses that are visible so just think of all the people like I know for me personally like I suffer with depression and anxiety and I've spent like thousands of dollars on counseling it's very helpful for me and it does and it is helpful but I know there's a lot of people out there that will go like go and do other treatments and and some of those people just want to do those things for the money or some of those people are actually like super dangerous but because it's like you're in such a desperate state because you're you're so alienated and you feel so alone that it's like it's like one of those like infomercial types of things where it's like if you want to be healthy in 10 days click on this youtube link or whatever you know so it's 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 it actually puts people in a more more vulnerable place and for them to be abused and misused by people that aren't genuinely trying to support them um and i think that that's like something that we need to consider as well is like if we're if if we're supposed to be those people who god's bringing to us or god has led to us 
to help in some form of way, even if we're not that person and we know someone that can support that person, then that's, that's our obligation as a Christian who to be helping and supporting people in ways that we know. And, and you can do that healthily because I know like, especially with, um, with some people, like once they find someone, they're like constantly messing, messaging you, or it's just because like, they're so excited that finally someone is understanding and, and giving them that support that they've craved. So it's, it, it also is about like setting boundaries for yourself, but there's so many support groups and so many people that are going through similar experiences that like we can try and connect people with so that they don't, they never feel alone or outcasted. Yeah, so 12 years is enough to click a lot of links, finding um, in, 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 in terms of finding a solution for her problem, isn't it, AJ? 12 years is, is quite a lot in that. We, we can only imagine what that means and we can only imagine how much she, 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 she did suffer because of her condition. And um, yeah, so yes, it, it is a lot of time. One of the, oh, did Matthew have a question? No, go on. I was going to move on, but it's, yeah, we go on. Oh, and this, it may not be the discussion to have in this discussion, but one of the things that I found interesting when I was um, reading over it, like just the passage, was that it said like she was hemorrhaging and then like because I'm really interested in health conditions in general I was like okay let's see if there's like any other type of thing that like is hemorrhaging because I know like it's said or it's interpreted as this woman was like menstruating let's say for 12 years or having spotting or something like that but you can have other hemorrhages in your body like other internal bleeding in your body that can actually like be seen to you so now I'm thinking maybe it was something that she covered up um like maybe it wasn't just like her having her period for 12 years because I, I really don't know how she would survive doing that <laughs> but it was just one of those things that came to mind of like wow like if, if if this was something that couldn't even like physically be seen um by other people and just she knew about it like I, I couldn't imagine how alone she must have felt. And again, if that was tied with something that like, uh, you know, people were so superstitious and thought like, oh my gosh, if you've got a, if you got a mark on your skin, you know, that means like you're unclean now or something like that. Like, I think it's like kind of what Steve was saying, what everyone's been saying is like, we can go to extremes so quickly without just talking to someone and, and yeah, educating ourselves by talking to that person, but also remembering that our, our main task of like what God told us to do is to like love him and love our neighbors. And if we're, if we're behaving in a manner that excludes people, um, then we need to really rethink what, what being Christian is all about. And we kind of also need to remember that when it comes to inclusiveness that we might be approaching the person where who has whatever it is they're they're suffering from whatever it is they're they're dealing with we might be approaching it for the first time but we have to remember that they're not and and so we don't want to be responsible for being uh an added microaggression <laughs> of like just adding to the pile of things that have already built up over time in the life of a person um even if like you know it's 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 unintentional harm um even if you know it's it's out of pure curiosity and wanting to know, to know how to to be a better friend or whatever it is um you know it's there's still an element of like needing to be conscious that you know even though it might be if we are to take Amy for as an example, like, you know, I'm finding about out about epilepsy for the first time. And so I'm coming to Amy to ask about epilepsy. Um, I have to acknowledge that, you know, Amy's not talking about epilepsy for the first time. <laughs> so it probably has to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Amy. No, I was just gonna say, not only would it not be for the first time, I can only represent my type. There's over 60 different types of seizure and people mainly only know the the massive one, you know, the 
tonic clonic seizure where you're on the floor shaking. So I can only represent mine <laughs> and that's it. So mm. I can't yeah. speak for all epileptics. It's just not possible. <laughs> Right, Matthew, lead us on. Yeah, we're kind of like touching on my next question anyway. <laughs> so it's like, um, yeah, so like the 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 woman um, in the Bible obviously had been going through this for twelve years, um, feed on a lot of um, doctors, physicians, um, and spent spent all she had on that. Um, so obviously, there's like the last attempt really was to go to Jesus um it was obvious it, 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 it looked like she'd been ignored by like so many people um either just didn't know about it or um or maybe even deliberately we don't really doesn't really tell us uh, so from this like what is obviously we <laughs> clearly we've already touched on it already but um what is the best way to or ways um for us to like see uh, if someone's going through this obviously that's that's a hard question because um it's it's an invisible illness it's called an invisible illness for a reason but like what is um the best way for us to see recognize and like help people um who are going through this kind of thing i mean i can jump in here and you know if we're if we're looking at it from a, a Christian perspective, then Christianity is meant to be all about community. And so if real community is taking place, then an illness that's invisible becomes visible because you know a person. Um, and uh, that's a lot harder to kind of address in a, in a wider society context because communities built up in in different ways but christian community is a very diverse community or at least it should be a very diverse community um i mean if we're quite honest it's probably very diverse in its membership not particularly diverse in its leadership particularly when it comes to mental illness or um or disabilities um not to say that you know the there aren't anyone that's in leadership that that has a a disability but it's very rare that you would come across it um particularly in church leadership but i th yeah i think the the communal aspect of christianity would would bring that to light and you'd hope that in it coming to light, that the community would bond even stronger and, and would find uh, ways in order to, to make sure that no one is excluded and no one is left on the sidelines uh, and marginalized. Um, but yeah, I'll stop talking now just to allow others in this discussion to contribute to that. <laughs> Yeah, I was kind of going to say basically what you said about just befriending people. I mean, like if we if we see how Jesus just approached people, it was just out of love and just out of like genuinely wanting to get to know someone because like he loves us so much. And when I think about like my interactions um, with with God, it's it's like he came to me as a friend. You know, like my happy moments were with him and I could, I can remember those things. And, and yeah, and, and yeah, I agree with what you're also saying about um, if we are, if we are wanting to learn more from people, it maybe for safeguarding others who, you know, they told the story a million times or it's traumatic for them or they don't want to talk about it at all. It's like, for me, like, I, maybe it's just a matter of like, can, can I speak with you about your epilepsy? And then that gives you the power to say yes or no. And, or, and, and also like, it's, it, it isn't something that people need to share at all. It's more of, um, 
yeah like a personal decision for you because it's so like it does put you in a vulnerable place I guess it's for me like um now I I have to consider coming with the with the attitude of like I'm asking a really really vulnerable thing to someone so I should be willing to be vulnerable about something as well and yeah I think like I feel like that's what God kind of does for us is like he may not say like oh well I this time blah 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 or anything like that but you can just feel that he understands um even though like I don't know it's hard to explain what I'm thinking in my head but I feel like those are some of the ways that that we can yeah better include people and and just thinking about like how church service is run it definitely isn't inclusive for people lots of different types of people um and it, it it's something that we should be at the forefront of if we claim to be you know if, if if god's kingdom is for everyone we need to make it look like that and we need to make it accessible to to everyone um so from facebook uh pastor herman again he says um it's easy to connect illness with sin that's what happened in biblical times uh, however it's still prevalent today this does not only include amy's illness but even other issues such as gender uh, etc uh, many believe the person is like that because they are not living correctly not being vegan or not following god's commands Um, I would agree with that, definitely. Um, I've uh, been approached within the church um, by members. So I think community is a great thing, but there's there are, and it's definitely helped me because I was uh, suicidal as a teenager due to my epilepsy and having the community there definitely saved me. Um, but um, with the good sometimes comes the bad so i've been approached saying oh like uh you're possessed by demons you are straight out evil right i've also been approached saying oh you should get anointed and you'll be cured or you should pray more and then you'd be cured um and uh like just things like that which it sort of eats at you a little bit um but i think um that that sort of comes with a sort of church environment especially the adventist one um because um there's this thing that i call um perfection theology which um i don't know if that is a thing but i call it that um and <laughs> it's basically like a fixation on um fixing people because you're supposed to be perfect like jesus um and everyone's supposed to strive to be perfect like jesus and um, so if you're disabled, unless you're cured, you are already not perfect. You are never going to be perfect. And so you feel really excluded by that. And people will say, like, my dad's a pastor. And I've been told that maybe I have epilepsy because my parents sinned or his parents sinned. Again, they're pastors. So um, I don't know, like, or I sinned is another one that they come up with but i got epilepsy when i was seven so i think that's unlikely um but this this um thing where um you have to strive to be better and better i think it's fantastic because um i think people should try to be better but it can come with a sort of price where disabled people are put in a box and they're never going to be there if you see what i mean I think, um, yeah, also to answer your question, Matthew, like when when I think about it, I kind of think it in two different ways. So there's like the personal sense, like what individuals should be doing. And then there's the more like the broader sense of like, um, well, like people are saying like community and stuff and society, because I think. Yeah, so so like what with Amy was saying before about how there are uh, 60 different types of um, seizures um so like when i heard that i was like i didn't know that i only like i only thought there was just like a seizure i wasn't aware of like there were so many so 
on the on the personal level, I think it would be easy to say, um, oh, I should just like you know educate myself about these stuff, um, which I try to do, but then also they like there's only so much that people can kind of not educate themselves on, but like care about. It sounds bad to put it that way, but like there's only so much that like an individual can do. So I feel like, yes, yeah, so that's the personal sense, but then I feel like that's also why the aspect of community and kind of building up a broader knowledge and understanding of these topics that like people are, have easier access to is, yeah, really important because I feel like if just left to individuals, um, like in my case, it'd be very easy to just not learn about this stuff because it doesn't necessarily influence me like that strongly. So I feel like that can be the danger with like leaving it to like your own education and stuff. But yes, yeah, so that's why I'd agree with what people were saying about the importance of like community and stuff and kind of, yeah, building up, um, yeah, just kind of having that people around you in like great society as well, where it's just easier for people to kind of discuss this type of thing. Um, I just wanted to say that um, there, sometimes it can be better to just have people available. Um, so like church elders or like, you know, the greeters at the door or like the pastor themselves, right? Um, they um, are like lifelines that people can hold on to who are safe people to talk to. So that I think is also quite important to, uh, and for people to know they're there for that, I think is, is important. <laughs> yeah, in, in thinking of um, the women that Matthew uh, brought the narrative for us, she didn't have anybody to, <laughs> to go to, did she, Amy? She didn't have anybody to at all. And also another aspect is that I think at this stage now, you have learned to confront and to be confrontational, to, to confront somebody that kind of attacks you. But in those days, Matthew, according to what you have told us, she didn't have one, nobody to go to. Two, she didn't have no rights to confront anybody that abuses her because of her condition. So I can only feel truly sorry for her and praise God that our society has evolved to something a little bit better than it was in those days. Um, but yeah, confronting, I, I don't even know we have time for that, but perhaps Amy, you may be talking to somebody that have not learned yet to confront somebody that abuses them because of of their condition either either deliberately or accidentally because they don't really know what the condition is is all about um so i don't know the confrontational side of um this hidden uh, units and how does how, how does that work how much confrontation and and can help as a way, as a mechanism of defense in these circumstances. Uh, Matthew, the the last bit of that story um, with the with the the woman that was hemorrhaging. Um, what I'm trying to rack my brain. I did read it and now I've forgotten. But what was what was Jesus' response right at the end? Um, so let me just get it up. So verse 48, and he said, um, and he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. That was, is, is, is that what you meant? Yes, that's exactly what I meant. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's good. <laughs> it's good uh, to reflect on the, those words of Jesus. I think, and, and what David was saying um, is also important. Um, <laughs> he talked about society evolving. But actually, uh, a lot of credit can be given to Christianity for the way that society has evolved. Um, and yes, in modern Christianity, there's been a fair amount of regression. But um, but at, and in those, uh, I mean, when you think back to like the ancient world as it was, um, you know, you have 
people like the the Spartans, where you know any type of deformity on somebody, and they were cast out into the wilderness, and you know no one survives, uh, particularly a newborn baby, <laughs> you know. Uh, and there were, there were all kinds of ancient societies that had the same kind of mentality, you know, uh, st- as as Amy was sharing in a, in a certain form of theology. You know, they were seeking action societies. Um, you know, maybe we make a mistake by trying to do the same within theology. Um, but it's um, and so but. Yeah, and so, you know, Christianity uh, actually formed a, a very vital role in, in the value to a human person, in, in restoring value to a human person. And this story that, that was shared um, in the Gospels is exactly that. It's, it's Jesus returning value to this person that was outcast from society uh you know if jesus accepts you then you know who who am i to not accept you uh, if jesus uh calls you daughter who am i to to not call you you know uh, a a sister in the family of god and and so I think that's that's a very key moment. Like what what was shared there in that story is a key point in human history, where where God steps into humanity, into humanity's world, and 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 changes its trajectory, where we're no longer a, a society of of people that outcast people, but we we start forming a society where we start drawing people in uh, and we create community that the world has never seen before and and you know it's a big challenge (laughs) it's a a big ask um but I, i think if we're honest with the gospels that's what's being asked of us that's that's what that's the challenge that's set before us um and it requires us having teachers who have hidden disabilities it requires us having teachers that have very obvious disabilities it requires us having teachers that are 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 black are asian are um are from you know various different parts of the world it requires us having teachers who are male and female it requires us having teachers from all different walks of life um, who are all community with us. Um, and yeah, it's, it's actually, it's us who lose out when we don't have that. Uh, so, so, I <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jackie from Facebook, she says, uh, I think there are so many examples in history and recent history at that where striving for perfection has simply led to death and destruction for thousands. To strive to be better is always an admirable way of living, but striving to be perfect will only lead to destruction, whether of others or ourselves, by corrupting the way way we think and in turn our mental health. Mm -hmm. Well said. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, I agree with what everybody said, and I think it's really unfortunate that we kind of forget that little passage in the Bible where it says, you know, all have sinned, and we all have a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus, so going back to what Amy was saying about, like, oh, you've got epilepsy because, you know, you're you sinned or your your father or whoever sinned and like I mean in my in my own little mind my my response would be like so what you're you're not a sinner because what would be the purpose of Jesus coming to earth for all of us if we were perfect and 
that's what that's what I go back to every time I try and like if I want to try and judge someone or whatever or I don't understand I'm just like well Lord you you get it so all you've asked me to do is love you let you let you love me to the point where I love the person you've made me to be that and that person is a sinner and that person is saved by your grace and saved by your mercy and that person needs you so desperately because they need to know that they're valued and important and and then it's like once you've embodied that and you and you and you know that and that's a lifelong journey that's when it's but along the way that's how we should be that's how we should be encouraging one another that's how we should be speaking to one another and and saying like and looking each other looking at each other and saying this is this is God's daughter this is God's son and he loves them just like he loves me and what what an incredible incredible act of faith it was for even Jesus to come to earth and and believe that you know like he like I'm sure there were times he didn't believe that that was going to be enough to save us all but he chose to do it anyway and it just blows my mind every time I think about it um and I can't remember why I said all this but yeah, just it just happened in my mind that, you know, like we, we should definitely be cautious with the things that we say and think about other people um, and definitely shouldn't be saying things like, you know, you you're this way because uh, you're a sinner because we're all sinners saved by grace. And and lest we forget that, because if, if there's if there is this like striving for perfection, it does not exist it does not exist. And I know for me, like I struggle with perfectionism, especially in my spiritual life, like my early like relationships with God. I was like, I just have to be this. I have to be this and that way. And that way I know I'm secure. And now I look back and I laugh at that because I'm like, wow, like you were so delusioned by thinking that you loved yourself when in actuality, the thoughts that like plague my mind about me is you know, like you're absolutely nothing, but thank God Jesus came to show each and every one of us in this world that we are his brothers and sisters and God's children. And that's the aim. That's the aim every single time is knowing that we're God's children and he loves us just the way that we are. Um, and that he sent Jesus to be that atonement and reunite us with him. I think it'd be quite important now to to kind of um, and probably I mean a few a few hints have been given throughout the discussion, but as as Christians as we um, as we approach life and trying to do life better and trying to be more inclusive and trying to be uh, and trying to make community happen, um, what are the best steps moving forward in order to make that a reality um and yeah once uh, once we've kind of done that we can also introduce jackie's question to kind of bring it to a little bit of a close um so yeah any thoughts anybody how can we how can we make how can we move forward? How can we make this more of a reality? How can we be more inclusive to those who, who have an invisible illness? Um, I think that um, an important thing in just like general uh, at work at, um, or out in public or um, in school would be um, if you see someone saying something, even if it's just like, you know, a little like a microaggression like try and correct them and be like mm, that's probably not great I mean you're, it's very difficult to do without being like oh you're wrong you know but um <laughs> I think it's important that they um know at the very least so they don't do it again even if they like don't apologize it for it at that point in time like maybe they'll look into it you know things like that and another thing was I think that a helpful way to 
look at people with invisible illness or visible illness is um, just assume that they have one because then you'll treat everybody the same anyway. Because um, this is an American statistic, but in America, 10% um, of the people that you see that are, uh, is, are the, um, that are physically disabled that you see that are not invisible, that's 10% of the disabled people. 90% of the people are invisible. So you will never know. Um, and they, they're amongst you. So <laughs> they're there. So um, I think just be empathetic to everybody if they've got something to say. Mm -hmm. I would say, um, if it was kind of weird to say, but like just making a start like somewhere. So like, for example, so at our church, Plymouth Church, um, I've been going there since I was a kid, like, you know, years and years. And I didn't even realize until someone mentioned it uh, when we were preparing for this Justice Friday that we don't even have um, like a disabled ramp at the front um, you know, for anybody who has a wheelchair, who might need to get in. Um, obviously, I know that's like a, a visible illness, but I feel like the same can apply. Like just making a start somewhere, like within the church where you don't see that kind of accessibility for people. And then, yeah, hopefully over time, as you become like more informed, as well as like people in the church become more informed, then hopefully, it, yeah, it becomes like bit by bit, like a bit easier for people with, um, illnesses both visible and invisible to kind of have access to church um, and yeah seem kind of more engaged with um, and like appreciated and loved by the Christian community so that's what I would say just kind of making a start somewhere yeah I was gonna say something similar um, just like being aware that these kind of illnesses and disabilities exist and at the same time not throwing someone out or like outcasting someone just because of that um like you may not know all the information and just like all the details about it but i think as long as you as if you know you're aware of it and you're not um throwing someone out i think that's that's like the first good thing you can do for that person um, if, that, if that makes sense um, and then like hopefully like you can increase your knowledge in like um like other like more more details and then you can help that person more i think that yeah as a first step it's like being aware not um throwing that person out because of um what they have yeah one of the things that I was going to say was like, one, spend time with God and like ask him, ask him, like, how can I, or like, yeah, how can I be, how can I be empathetic to, to people like suffering from an invisible illness or sorry, experiencing the invisible illness or, or, or physical difference or anything like that. And and one of the things also is like spend time with with those people. Um, and as Amy was saying, like she, that's her experience of epilepsy, but other people's experiences are gonna be different because they're all different people. And let's say you don't have someone um, who has epilepsy in your church. Like there's this really great um, YouTube channel. I think it's called Jubilee or or a sort or something else but i'm pretty sure it's jubilee and they have something like do all just 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 as an example do all dyslexic people think the same do all uh do all women think the same do all whatever like think the same basically and it, it's, it's a really beautiful way to to diversify yourself if you're not around a lot of diversity and um, that's another way that you can be educated. It's, it's, yes, it's the facts of what actually is this, but that's also going to be evolving as, as more research happens and things like that as well. Like for some things, it'll be concrete. And for others, it's still growing and learning just like us. And so, um, yeah, taking the time to do that so that 
we we can't say like oh well I, I don't know anyone that's an excuse like we live in an era of being able to go onto the internet and and research things and 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 yes there is a danger of misinformation or whatnot but like go to hearing people's voices and experiences that's that's the richest that's the richest like I'm sorry I'm, I'm doing like a qualitative research right now so I'm just like that's the richest stuff right there like just listening to people you don't and, and like like Steve and Amy were saying like you don't have to approach everyone all the time but you can listen to a podcast you can follow someone on Instagram who who uh, has depression or has another invisible illness or something like that or and you can that's how you can create awareness as well so there's there's many tools and many ways that that we can look for ways to to I guess like grow in compassion and obviously the Bible is going to teach us about that as well and and seeing how Jesus spoke to people who were different and now he interacted with them uh, so if no one has anything else to add this is Jackie's um question from earlier which hopefully can be answered um so she said a friend of mine recently started having seizures, which are currently undiagnosed, although they believe they might be linked to epilepsy, but it's greatly affected their everyday life and made coming into uni to study nearly impossible. What would you recommend to those in a university to help accommodate their return to the campus itself and to make them feel comfortable to return? Obviously, training for such situations, as you say, is a great step but is there anything you would suggest to encourage the person themselves to feel able to return to uni? Uh, that's a very hard question. <laughs> um, I, I would say it depends on what they're afraid of. Are they afraid of having seizures in front of people? Um, if so, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Sorry. <coughs> Um, uh, it's a hard question because I tried to study myself and I couldn't concentrate on the work because I kept having seizures and more seizures. I'd probably try again, but at the time it was definitely not the right time. I think maybe you'd have to decide whether you are able to do it. And if not, it will hurt. It will hurt. Um, but sometimes it's better to accept and move on than it is to just hold on to the resentment and um, like, oh, why is my life so terrible, you know? Um, but also um, I think that if you can, maybe you need to like uh, focus, it's, Okay, this is a hard question. Um, it's good to focus on all of the bits of you that are good still, you know, like epilepsy is not you, you know, epilepsy is part of you and it influences you, but it's not you, right? So if people are judging you because of your epilepsy, it's not you, so it doesn't matter, you know? Um, secondly, um, if it's not because you feel like you're being judged, it's like an accessibility thing, you'd have to bring that up with your university and they're supposed to help you. Whether they will, I don't know. Um, and thirdly, I think it's thirdly, anyway, um, maybe it's something you need to postpone and come back to. Like sometimes you have to just be like, it, is, is it better for me to do this now and definitely do it now and just try really hard even though it's really difficult or should I come back later once all of this has been sorted out first, find out why I'm having the seizures, why is this happening? And um, it sometimes is better to come back later on and finish it then. Uh, I hope that helps. It was a bit, you know, everywhere, but. <laughs> yeah, that's not an easy, easy question to answer. It's, uh, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a really tough one, especially to end a, a discussion on. <laughs> uh very tricky but i think you answered that one really well amy mm. um yeah I, I don't i think it's very important to state that there's no shame on putting a pause on something um there's there's no 
there's no shame in 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 saying all right there's something new that's just entered my life um i need to understand it a bit more and what i was doing can wait until i understand this a little bit more and you know university is there like it's not going anywhere it's <laughs> it, it's right there it, it is better to to have a fuller understanding of yourself and then tackle university than it than it is to to try and do both at the same time because that that is a crazy roller coaster to uh, <laughs> to ride uh not to say that you can't do it like you know some people can do that stuff but uh yeah i don't know i'm pretty sure that i wouldn't do it if it was me i would also say that if you can find an epilepsy support group mm. definitely do it especially if you're newly diagnosed or not even diagnosed yet um but they will definitely help you because they've gone through the same thing um i would always recommend that yeah i was gonna say what amy was gonna say and and yeah, I totally agree with Steve about, um, and Amy, sorry, about like, pause is fine. If you feel like you still want to pursue university, there are um, channels that you can go through in your university. I think it's like contacting the well-being and support team. And also another thing is like, this is written into law. So you are you will be able to have adjustments and it does depend on the university, but having, I would say like, if you have a really good support system around you, try and get other people to, to kind of do those types of things because it can be exhausting. It, it's like a full-time job in itself. And I can say that because I've got like invisible illnesses as well. And, and if it's chronic and obstructing your life and it's, or it's sporadic and you don't know when it's going to present itself, that adds another layer of stress. So I know if you're, if you are doing like a health course or something like that, um, speak to the occupational health team because they're the type of people that help you to make it more manageable for you. Um, but yeah, talk to your university and the well, the well-being team and see what can be done so that if you want to continue your education, you can, you might be on a course that's able to do part-time. Um, or if not, I know like with, when it comes to student finance and stuff, you can pause your degree for up to a year and then they will pay for your other two years or something that or however long it is. Um, so there, there are ways to do that. But like Amy was saying, I think the most important thing is to, to, um, have some support take and, and take time to just adjust to your new lifestyle because it is it can be really overwhelming and demotivating and depressing and, and, and a combination of all those things but um, yeah it's it the choice is yours at the end of the day and and I think the main thing is yeah allow yourself time to to actually enjoy what you're doing and, and know that you don't have to you don't have to like I, I, when I say kill yourself, like I don't mean end your life, but I just mean like you don't have to let it get to the point where it's 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 affecting you to the point where you're not able to enjoy life because you're like, no, I, I have to prove, I have to prove, I have to prove. You don't have to prove anything because you are going through a life altering experience. And, and yeah, if people people are beginning to understand now that if you don't take that time to pause or reach out for help or support, like we saw in the biblical example, you're going to be alone. And it's, it's, it's not, it's not the way that God intends for you to, to live. So, uh, so thank you have... for reaching out and asking the question as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, there are no more questions from Facebook. Um, and yeah, if no one has anything to add, I will pass to Pastor David, who will give the closing prayer for us. Yeah. Well, I think we should kind of like just round up really quickly with like, you know, uh, just a massive thank you, obviously, Amy, for, for joining us this evening and for sharing that experience. I think it's been really valuable for every one of us in the discussion. Uh, and also for those that have been joining us online and 
And then also a massive thank you to everyone that's joined us online uh, for mm -hmm. taking the time to, to be with us and to, to engage in this topic with us. Um, and all we can really hope for and pray for is that uh, momentum progresses from this for us to be continuously a more inclusive people and and to to allow make ways and allow ways um to to happen that that in, that make that in, that allows for everyone to be involved to be part of the community to not feel like they're on the margins um to so that everybody feels like they're center um and yeah if that's something we can conclude from this discussion today then i think we we've achieved something and we're we're walking in a in a good direction yeah absolutely thanks very much steven and thank you so much once again amy for joining us as our special guest today and we look forward to the next one which is going to be august um the last friday of august which is going to be um, yeah, the last Friday of, of August, that's the day um, that we are going to meet again. We'll be sharing uh, the topic for the next Justice Fridays uh, very soon. And also, um, Stephen, if I would like to, if, if you allow me, I would like to mention those that are going to be watching uh, later as it's going to be available on our Facebook page and also on the uh, Plymouth SCA YouTube channel. It's going to be there as well for those that want to be there um, and watch it. And also the last three topics um, that we had, which was April, May, and June, are already on our YouTube channel. So if anybody wanted to share with anybody who is not on Facebook, you can just share uh, the, the YouTube link, which is going to be on the comments. On the comment session of this live, we are going to be sharing there the, the YouTube link as well. If there is no more comments from anybody, I would like to say a word of prayer, unless anybody else would want to say anything. No, so no more comments on Facebook, no more comments for those joining us. So with that in mind, thank you so much once again, everybody, and let's pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the calling that was extended to each one of us, that we love more, that we accept more, and that we be less judgmental. Help each one of us as we grow in Christ. It is for Jesus, our Savior, friend, and Redeemer, that we pray. Amen. Okay, bye, everybody.